Book 4, Supplementary Detailed Staff Reports on Foreign and Military Intelligence, Part 2, The Dulles Era, 1953 through 1961. Introduction. During the years 1953 to 1961, the agency emerged as an integral element in high-level United States policymaking. The CIA's covert operational capability provided the agency with the stature it required, acquired. Rather than functioning in a strict support role to the state and defense departments, the CIA assumed the initiative in defining the ways covert operations could advance U.S. policy objectives and in determining what kinds of operations were suited to particular policy needs. The force of Alan Dulles' leadership and his recognition throughout the government as the quintessential case officer accounted in large part for the enhancement of the shift in the agency's position. The reason for Dulles' influence extended well beyond his personal qualities and inclinations. The composition of the United States government, international events, and senior policymakers' perception of the role the agency would play in the United States foreign policy converged to make Dulles' pos position in the government and that of the agency unique in the years 1953 to 1962. The 1952 election brought Dwight D. Eisenhower to the presidency. Eisenhower had been elected on a strident anti-communist platform advocating an aggressive worldwide stance against the Soviet Union to replace what he described as the Truman administration's passive policy of containment. Eisenhower cited the communist victory in China, the Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe, and the Korean War as evidence of the passivity which had prevailed in the United States government following World War II. He equally strong in calling he was equally strong in calling for an el elimination of government corruption and removal of communist sympathizers from public office. I remember the CIA established all of that before. So at this presidency he's fear mongering the sheeple uh, the administration is telling the sheeple what they want the sheeple to hear, that all of these civil wars were created by nothing but CIA through congressional action. And I'll read on. This was not simply elec election rhetoric. The extent to which the urgency of the communist threat had become a shared perception is difficult to appreciate. By the close of the Korean War, a broad consensus had developed about the nature of Soviet, Soviet ambitions and the need for the United States to respond. In the minds of government officials, members of the press, and the informed public, the Soviets would try to achieve their purposes by perpetrating and subverting governments all over the world. Or so they said. The accepted role of the United States was to prevent that expansion. Washington policymakers regarded the Central Intelligence Agency as a major weapon, both offensive and de defensive, against communism. By 1953, the agency's contributions in the areas of political action and paramilitary warfare were recognized and respected. The CIA alone could perform many of the activities seemingly required to meet the Soviet threat. For senior government officials, covert operations had become a vital tool in the pursuit of the United States foreign policy objectives. During the 1950s, the CIA attracted some of the most able lawyers, academicians, and young, committed activists in the country. They brought with them professional associations and friendships which extended to their senior levels of government. This informal network of contracts enhanced the stature of the agency considerably. Men such as Frank Wisner, Desmond Fitzgerald, then in the Far East Division of DDP and later Deputy Director for Plans, C. Tracy Barnes, the special assistant to Wisner for paramilitary and psychological operations, William Bundy, an analyst in the Office of National Estimates, Kingman Douglas, former investment banker and head of OCI, and Loftus Becker, then deputy director for intelligence, had developed a wide array of contracts, contacts which bridged the worlds of government, business law, journalism, and politics at their highest levels. The fact that senior agency officials had shared similar wartime experiences, came from comparable social backgrounds, and served 
in positions comparable in those of other government officials contributed significantly to the legitimacy and of and confidence in the agency as an instrument of government. Moreover, these informal ties created a shared consensus among policymakers about the role and direction of the agency. At the working level, these contracts were facilitated by the agency's location in downtown Washington. Housed in a sprawling set of buildings in the center of the city, along the reflecting pond at the mall and elsewhere, agency personnel could easily meet and talk with state and defense officials throughout the day. The CIA's physical presence in the city gave it the advantage of seeming an integral part of, rather than a separate element of the government. No one was more convinced than Alan Dulles that the agency could make a special contribution to the advancement of the United States foreign policy goals. Dulles came to the post of DCI in February 1953 with an extensive background in foreign affairs and foreign espionage. By the time of his appointment, his interest in his view of the CIA had been firmly established. The son of a minister, Dulles was raised in a family which combined strong sense of moral purpose with a long tradition of service at senior levels of government. This background gave Alan Dulles and his older brother John Foster the opportunity to participate in international affairs and brought a dimension of the conviction of, to their ideas and opinions. Before becoming DCI, Dulles' background included 10 years in the Foreign Service with assignments to the Versailles Peace Conference, Berlin, and Constantinople. Law practice in New York followed after the outbreak of World War II. William Donovan called on Dulles to serve in OSS. Dulles was assigned to Bern, the center for OSS activities against the Germans, where he developed a, a dazzling array of operations against the Germans and Italians. After the war, Dulles returned to law practice in New York. He served as consultant to DCI's Vandenberg and Hillenkauter, and in 1948, President Truman and Secretary Forrestal asked him to participate in the National Security Council survey of the CIA. So here they are surveying themselves. Isn't that nice? He joined the agency in January 1951 as the Deputy Director for Plans. Later that year, he replaced William Jackson as DDCI, a position he held until February 1953, when he was named Battle Smith's successor. Dulles' experience in the Foreign Services, OSS, and the law coupled with his naturally gregarious personality had won him a vast array of domestic and international contracts in government, law, and the press. As DCI, Dulles used and cultivated these contracts freely to enhance the agency's stature. He made public speeches, met quietly with members of the press, and socialized constantly in Washington society. Dulles' unofficial activities were indicative of the web of association which existed among senior agency personnel and the major sector of Washington society. By the early 1950s, the CIA had gained a reputation among United States government agencies as a young, vital institution serving the highest national purpose. In 1953, Dulles took a dramatic stand against Senator Joseph McCarthy and his action contributed significantly to the agency's reputation as a liberal institution. At a time when the State Department and even the military services were cowering before McCarthy's preposterous charges and attempting to appease a Wisconsin senator, Dulles openly charged challenged McCarthy's attacks on the agencies. He denied McCarthy's charges publicly, had Senate subpoenas quashed, and demanded that McCarthy make available to him any evidence of com communist influence or subversion to the agency. Within a month, McCarthy backed off. The episode had an important impact on agency morale and on the public's perception of the CIA. As virtually the only government agency that had successfully resisted McCarthy's allegations and intrusions, the CIA was identified as an organization that fostered free and independent thinking. Yeah, sounds like it through thuggery, right? <laughs> A crucial factor in securing the agency's place within the government during this period was the fact that the Secretary of State, John Foster, 
Dulles and the DCI were brothers. Whatever the formal relationships among the State Department, the National Security Council and the CIA, they were superseded by the personal and working association between the brothers. Most importantly, both enjoyed the absolute confidence of President Eisenhower. In the day-to-day -day formulation of policy, these relationships were crucial to the executive support for the agency and more specifically for Alan Dulles personally in defining his own role and that of the agency. Dulles' role as DCI was rooted in his wartime experience with OSS. His interests and expertise lay with the operational aspects of intelligence and his fascination with the details of operations persisted. Perhaps the most important effect of Dulles' absorption with the operations was its impact on the agency's relationship to the intelligence community, the intelligence components in the Department of State and Defense. As DCI, Dulles did not assert his, his position or the agencies in attempting to coordinate departmental intelligence activities. For the agency, this constituted a lost opportunity. Throughout the 1950s, the CIA was in the forefront of technological innovation and developed a strong record on military estimates. Conceivably, Dulles could have used these advances as bureaucratic leverage in exerting some control over the intelligence community. He did not. Much of the reason was a matter of personal temperament. Jolly and extroverted in the extreme, Dulles disliked and avoided confrontations at every level. In so doing, he felt to provide even minimal direction over the intelligence agencies at a time when intelligence capabilities were undergoing dramatic changes. Dulles was equally inattentive to the administration of the agency itself, and the real internal management responsibility fell to the able Deputy Director General Charles P. Cabell, who served throughout Dulles' term. The Clandestine Service it is both easy to exaggerate and difficult to appreciate the position which the clandestine service secured in the CIA during the Dulles administration and, to a large extent, retained thereafter. The number and extent of the activities undertaken are far less important than the impact which those activities had on the agency's institutional identity. The way people within DDP and DDI and the DDA perceived the agency's primary mission and the way policymakers regarded its contribution to the progress of government, process of government. Covert action was at the core of this perception and its importance to the internal and external evaluation of the agency was derived largely from the fact that only the CIA could and did perform this function. Moreover, in the international environment in the 1950s, Agency operations were regarded as an essential contribution to the attainment of the United States foreign policy objectives. Political action, sabotage, support to democratic governments, counterintelligence, all this the clandestine service could provide. The agency also benefited from what were widely regarded as its operational successes in this period. In 1953 and 1954, two of the agency's boldest most spectacular covert option operations took place, the overthrow of Premier Mohammad Mossadegh in Iran and the coup against President Jacob Albin Guzman of Guatemala. Both were allegedly communist associate leaders and replaced them with pro-Western officials. Out of these early acclaimed achievements, both the agency and the Washington policymakers acquired a sense of confidence in the CIA's capability for operational success. The popular perception was an accurate reflection of the agency's internal dynamics. The clandestine service occupied a preeminent position within the CIA. First, it had the constant attention of the DCI. Dulles was absorbent in the day-to-day -day details of operations, working closely with Wisner and his key subordinates. Dulles conceived ideas for projects, conferred with desk officers, and delighted in the smallest achievements. Dulles never extended comparable time with and attention to the DDI. The DDP continued to command the major portion of agency resources. Between, between 1953 and 1961, clandestine collection and covert action absorbed an average of 54% of the agency's total annual budget.
Although this percentage represented a reduction from the period of the Korean War, the weight of the agency's expenditures still fell to the DDP. During the same period, the DDP gained nearly 2,000 personnel. On its formal table or organization, the DDP registered an increase of only 1,000 personnel. However, increases of nearly 1,000 in the logistics and communications components of the DDA represented growth and support to clandestine service operations. A. Internal procedures, secrecy, and its consequences. Within the agency, the DDP was a directorate apart. Because of presumed security needs, the DDP was exempt from many of the review procedures that existed within the agency. Secrecy was deemed essential to the success and protection of DDP activities. The demands of security as defined by individuals within the DDP resulted in capricious administrative procedures. Wisner and Dulles condoned and accepted exceptional organizational arrangements. Neither man was a strong manager and neither had the disposition to impose or to adhere to strict lines of authority. Both men believed that the functional dynamics of clandestine activities required the absence of routinization and it was not unusual for either of them to initiate projects independent of the staffs and divisions that would ordinarily be involved. Although the Comptroller's Office was responsible for tracking budgetary expenses in the DDP on a project-by-project -project basis, special activities were exempt from such review. For example, foreign intelligence projects whose sensitivity required that they be authorized at the level of the Assistant Deputy Director for Plans or above were not included in the Comptroller's accounting. Records on the costs of such projects were maintained within the Directorate by the foreign intelligence staff. Often, political projects which had a highly sensitive classification were implemented without full information being provided to the DDA or to the Comptroller. The Office of the Inspector General was formally established in 1951 to serve as an intra-agency monitoring unit. Its range of duty included surveys of agency components and consideration of grievances. Until 1957, there were restrictions on the office's authority to investigate the DDP components and to examine specific operational problems within the directorate. The DDP maintained its own inspection groups, group staffed by its own careerists. The DDP became a highly compartmented structure in which information was limited to small groups of individuals. Throughout the directorate, information was subject to the need to know of rule. This was particularly true of highly sensitive political action and paramilitary operations, but it was also routine practice to limit the routing of cable traffic from the field to headquarters. Within the DDP, exceptions to standards guidelines for project approval and review were frequent. In certain cases, an operation for the identity of an agent was known only to the deputy director for plans and the two or three officers directly involved. In the words of a former high-ranking DDP official, flexibility is the name of the game. A forceful case can be made in support of these procedures for reasons of counter-espionage, maximum creativity, etc. However, their arrangements place enormous, enormous premiums on the professional integrity of the individuals involved and left many decisions subject to the strains and lapses of personal judgments. The agency's drug testing program is a clear example of their excesses that resulted from a system that allowed individuals to function with the knowledge that their actions would not be subject to scrutiny from others either within or outside the DDP. Testing and experiments were conducted without the participants' prior knowledge and without medical screening, and drugs were administered without participation of trained medical or scientific personnel. One person is known to have died as a result of agency experimentations. Those responsible for the drug testing programs were exempt from routine agency procedures of accountability and approval. Blurred lines of authority continued to characterize relationships among the DDP components. As discussed earlier, the intended roles of the fundamental staffs and the geographical divisions, administrative support versus operational control, had broken down under the incentives to generate and manage projects. During this period, both the Covert Action CA, staff and the Counterintelligence CI staff ran field operations while also serving as advisory and coordinating bodies for the operations conducted by the geographical divisions.
The CI staff actually monopolized counterintelligence operations and left little latitude to the divisions to develop and implement their own counterintelligence activities. The staff maintained their own communications channels with the field and CI operatives were frequently conducted without the knowledge of their respective DDP division. Chiefs or station chiefs, the exempt example of the CI staff is extreme. It was derived from personal influence that CI Chief James Angleton exercised for nearly 20 years. Nonetheless, the CI staff indi is indicative of the compartmentalization within the di di directorate that created pockets of privilege for specific operations. An important consequence of the degree of the compartmentation that existed in the clandestine service was the impact on the intelligence process. Theoretically, the data collected by the DDP field offices could have served as a major source for DDI analysis. However, strict compartmentalization prevented open contact between the respective DDP divisions and DDI components. The overriding element in the, distinct, in the distant relationship between the DDP and the DDI was the so-called sources and methods rule. DDI analysts seldom had access to raw data from the field. In the decade of the 1950s, information collected from the field was transmitted to headquarters and summarized there for dissemination to all of the analytic components throughout the government, including the DDI. The DDP adhered strictly to its principle of not revealing the identity of its assets. Reports gave only vague descriptions of assets providing information. Intelligence analysts found this arrangement highly unsatisfactory since they could not judge the quality of information they were receiving without some better indication of the nature and reliability of the source. Analysts therefore tended to look upon DDP information, however limited their access to it, with reservations and relied primarily on overt materials and comment for their production efforts. Throughout Dulles' term, dust-to-dust -dust contact between DDP officers and DDI analysts was practically non-existent. The rationale for this was to prevent individual analysis from imposing requirements on the collectors. The DDP viewed itself as serving the community's clandestine collection needs subject to government-wide requirements. The DDI leadership, on the other hand, believed that the DDP would be should be responsible. Sorry, the DDI leadership, on the other hand, believed that the DDP should respond primarily to its requirements. The DDP's definitions prevailed. The clandestine service maintained control over determining which requests it it accepted from the community. Intelligence requirements were established through a subcommittee of the Intelligence Advisory Committee. After the intelligence priorities were defined, the DDP's foreign intelligence staff reviewed them and accepted or voted the re vetoed the requirements unilaterally. Moreover, because the requirements were very general, the DDP had considerable latitude in, in interpreting and defining the specific collection objectives. The most significant consequence of this process was that the DDP itself essentially controlled the specific requirements for its collectors without ongoing consultation with the DDI. The existence of this enforced isolation between the two directorates negated the potential advantages of having collections and analysts in the same agency. Despite efforts in the 1960s to break down the barriers between the directorates, the lack of real interchange and interdependence persisted. The tolerance of flexible procedures within the DDP, the Directorate's exemption from accountability to outside components, and the DCI's own patronage gave the DDP a considerable degree of freedom in undertaking operations. In addition, the loose process of external review discussed later in this section contributed to the Directorate's independence. The DDP's relative autonomy in the agency also affected the mission and functions of the other two directorates. In the case of the DDI, the consequences were significant for the ex execution of the intelligence function. These patterns solidified under Dulles and shaped the long-term configuration of the agency. B. 
clandestine activities from 1953 through 1961. Covert action expanded significantly in the 1953 to 1961 period. Following the Korean War and their accompanying shift in the perception of the Soviet threat from military to political, the CIA concentrated its operation on political action, particularly support to electoral candidates and to political parties. The agency also continued to develop its paramilitary capability, employing it in Guatemala in 1954, the Far East, and in the ill-fated Bay of Pigs landing in Cuba in 1961. Relative to the paramilitary operations in Laos and Vietnam in the 1960s, the scale of these activities was minimal. Geographically, the order of priorities was Western Europe, the Far East, and Latin America. With the Soviets in Eastern Europe and Communist Party still active in France and Italy, Europe appeared to be the area most vulnerable to Communist encroachments. The CIA station in West Berlin was the center of CIA operations against Eastern Europe, and the German branch of the European Division was the agency's largest single country component. By 1962, the Western Hemisphere Division had experienced considerable success in penetrating the major Communist parties in Latin America. They're just taking over everything, aren't they? Just as the agency's activities reflected certain geographical patterns, they also displayed functional patterns. In the period 1952 through 1963, the agency acquired most of its clandestine information through liaison arrangements with foreign governments. Both Wisner and Dulles cultivated relations with foreign intelligence officials, and because of the United States' predominant post-war position, Governments in Western Europe in particular were very willing to cooperate in information sharing. Liaison provided the agency with sources and contracts, contacts that otherwise would have been denied them. Information on individuals, on political parties, on labor movements, all derived in part from liaison. Certainly the difficulty and long-term nature of developing assets was larger, largely responsible for the CIA's initial reliance on liaison. The existence of close liaison relationships inhibited developing independent assets. First, it was simply easier to rely on information that had already been gleaned from agents. Regular meetings with local officials allowed CIA officers to ask questions and to get the information they needed with minimal effort. It was far easier to talk to colleagues who had numerous assets in places than to expend the time required merely to make contact with an individual whose potential would not be realized for years. Second, maintenance of liaison became an in, in itself against which independent collection operations were judged. Rather than serving as supplementary to agency operations, it assumed primary importance in Western Europe. Often a proposal for an independent operation was rejected because the station chief believed that if the operation were exposed, the host government's intelligence service would be offended. Reliance on liaison did not mean that the agency was not developing its own capability. Liaison itself enhanced this agency's political action capability through the information it provided on the domestic situation in the host country. With the Soviet Union and Communist parties as the, as the targets, the agency concentrated on developing anti-communist political strength. Financial support to the individual's candidates, subsidies to publications, including newspapers and magazines, involvement in local and national labor unions, all of these interlocking elements constituted the fundamentals of a typical political action program. Elections, of course, were key operations, and the agency at involved itself in electoral politics on a continuing basis. Likewise, case officers groomed and cultivated individuals who could provide strong pro-Western leadership. Now everybody should stop here and go look at the definition of what a useful idiot is. Beyond the varying forms of political action and liaison, the agency's program of clandestine activities aimed at, aimed at developing an international anti-communist ideology.
Within the agency, the International Organization Division coordinated this extensive organizational propaganda effort. The division's activities included oper operations to assist or to create international organizations for youth, students, teachers, workers, veterans, journalists, and jurists. Now, this includes Hitler Youth Camps and the American Education Program. This kind of activity activity was an attempt to lay an in, to lay an intellectual foundation for anti-communism around the world. Ultimately, the organizational underpinnings could serve as a political force in assuring the establishment or maintenance of democratic governments. The etymology on democracy stems from demo, which means people in Greek, and kratis, which means to control or possess. Democracy or democratic theory is the action of controlling and possessing people. C. Executive authorization of covert action. During the Dulles period, there were several attempts to regularize and improve the process of executive coordination and authorization of covert action. Although the changes provided a mechanism for agency accountability to the executive, none of their arrangements significantly restricted CIA activities. The perception of American foreign policy objectives encouraged the development of anti-communist activities. The agency held the advantage in its ability to introduce project proposals based on detailed knowledge of internal conditions in a given foreign country. That is espionage. Dola's personal influence and the fact of his brother's position, which was Secretary of State, lent enormous weight to any proposal that originated with the agency. There you have the power. This is what's happening now with the Syria civil war. This was all created by the CIA to maintain corporate policy. Ever feel as though human beings are being farmed? You know, your food is chosen by the FDA, you're told what drugs you can take, what drugs you can't take, what drugs you must take. Your productive value is harvested from you daily. Sales tax, income tax, property tax, utility bills, mortgages, interest payments. When you exercise a bit of freedom on feed or food, traveling or other matters, the farmer cracks down on you. Ever thought of leaving the farm? Learn how. Join Pat and Tammy for Leaving the Farm, Saturdays, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, Studio A. See you there, or at the feed trough. Until 1955, no formal approval mechanism existed outside the agency for covert action projects. Since 1948, when covert action was first authorized, Senior State Department and Defense Department officials were designated to provide only loose policy guidelines to the CIA, with the assumption that covert operations would be infrequent. As covert activities proliferated, loose understandings rather than specific review formed the basis for CIA's accountability for covert operations. Following the Korean War, the Defense Department's role in rela relation to covert action became more one of providing physical support to the agency's paramilitary operations. The liaison between DOD and the CIA was not channeled through lo lower levels, but was handled by designated DOD representatives. For several years, there was some tension between the two agencies because the def Defense Department official who was responsible for liaison was not trusted by senior agency personnel. In 1957, he was dismissed, and his replacement was able to ease relations between the two agencies. Apart from day-to-day -day liaison at the working level, a series of senior bodies developed over the years to provide guidance for the initiation of covert operations. The Psychological Strategy Board, or PSB, and National Security Council Subcommittee had been established in 1951. Since both departmental representatives and PSB staff members sat on the board, it was too large and too widely representational 
to function as a senior policy-making body. The board's definition of covert activity was also faulty, since it assumed a neat distinction between psychological operations and political and paramilitary operations. With the proliferation of activities in the latter two categories, there was a need to include these programs in the policy guidance mechanism. Where the initiative for change originated is unclear, but in September 1953, the Operations Coordinating Board, or OCB, was established to replace the PSB. Okay, that replaced the Psychological Board. So at that point in time, it became the Operations Coordinating Board, or OCB. That's PSYOPs under Operations Coordination. Although the new board's membership was restricted to deputy-level officials, it never served in an approved capacity. Moreover, its interdepartmental composition made Dulles reluctant to discuss secret operations with OCB members. Dulles employed the OCB primarily to gain lacking backing for requests to the Bureau of bu the Budget for Reserve Releases to meet unbudgeted expense. Now what that is, is under directly under FEMA, Federal Emergency Management, act uh, using psychological welfare on human beings across the globe. You have to realize what this means to you right here, right now. In March and November 1955, two National Security Council policy directives, National Security Council 54121 and National Security Council 54122 were issued outlining revised control pr procedures. They established a group of designated representatives of the President and Secretaries of State and Defense to review and approve covert action projects. Irregular procedures characterized the group's functioning. The actual membership of the 5,412 Committee or Special Group, as it came to be known, varied as ad hoc tra task forces were organized for different situations. Neither the CIA nor the group established clearly defined criteria for submitting projects to the National Security Council body, and until 1959, meetings were infrequent. In that year, regular re weekly meetings began, but the real initiative for projects continued to rest with the agency. Special group members frequently did not feel confident enough to judge agency capabilities or to determine whether a particular project was feasible. After the Bay of Pigs failure, President Kennedy requested a review of U.S. paramilitary capabilities. The President's request assumed the necessity for continued, indeed, expanded operations, and the purpose of the report was to explore ways of ensuring successful future paramilitary actions, as well as determining why the Bay of Pigs landing had failed. Directed by General Maxwell Taylor, the report recommended strengthening the top-level direction for operations by establishing a review group with permanent membership. As a result of the report, the standing members of the special group included George Bundy, the Special Assistant for National Security Affairs as Chairman, U. Alexis Johnson, Under Secretary of State, Roswell Gilpatrick, Deputy Secretary of Defense, the DCI, and General Lyman Lemmett, sir, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This group assumed a more vigorous role in planning and reviewing covert operations. D. Congressional Review During the term of Alan Dulles, the Congressional Committee structure and the perception of the agency as first-line defense against communism remained the determinants in the relationship between the CIA and the Congress. Dulles himself reinforced the existing procedures through his casual, friendly approach to Congress, and he secured the absolute trust of sen senior ranking members. While Dulles was DCI, Richard Russell continued as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Charl Carl Vinson remained as chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, and from 1955 to 1964, Clarence Cannon held the chairmanship of the House Appropriations Committee. Dulles's appearance before a group consisted of a tour to Horizon on the basis of which members would ask questions. Yet the procedure was more perfunctory than rigorous.
Likewise, members often prefer not knowing about agency activities. Leverett Saltonstall, the former Massachusetts Senator and a ranking member of the Senate Armed Services and Appropriations Committee, stated candidly, Dominated by the committee chairman, members would ask few questions which dealt with internal agency matters or with specific operations. The most sensitive discussions were reserved for one-to-one -one sessions between Dulles and individual committee chairmen. In spite of the appearance of a comfortable relationship between Congress and the agency, there were serious efforts to alter the nature of the procedures. During the Dulles administration, there were two strong but unsuccessful attempts to strengthen Congress's oversight role and to broaden the participation of members in the execution of the committee's responsibilities. The failure of these attempts derived principally from the strength of the committee system and from the adroit tactics of the executive branch in deflating the impetus for change. In 1955, Senator Mike Mansfield introduced a resolution for a joint oversight committee. The Mansfield resolution resulted from a congressional survey of the executive branch. The Hoover Commission, chaired by former President Herbert Hoover, Hoover was established in 1954 to evaluate the organization of executive agencies. A small task force under General Mark Clark was assigned responsibility for the intelligence community. The prospect of a survey of the clandestine service information from which would be reported to the full Congress led President Eisenhower presumably, presumably in consultation with Alan Dulles to request a separate classified report on the DDP to be delivered to him personally. The group charged with the investigation was the Doolittle Committee, so named after its chairman, General James Doolittle, a distinguished World War II aviator. In turn, the Clark Task Force agreed not to duplicate the activities of the Doolittle Committee. Essentially, the arrangement meant that the Congress was prevented from conducting its own investigation into the clandestine services. Yeah, right. They're directing policy, by the way. You have to realize that Congress and the Board of Governors uh, General Counsel is one directing policy. And so what they're saying is they don't really care how it's done. Just get it done. Among the members of the Clark Task Force, Clark and Admiral Richard L. Connolly were responsible for the CIA. The task force found an excessive emphasis on covert action over intelligence analysis and in particular criticized the quality and quantity of the agency's intelligence on the Soviet Union. With regard to the Congress, the task force recommended the establishment of an oversight group, a mixed permanent body including members of Congress and distinguished private citizens. The full Hoover Commission did not adopt the task force proposal, but instead recommended two bodies, a joint congressional oversight committee and a group comprised of private citizens. It was on the basis of the Commission's recommendation that Senator Mansfield introduced his resolution on January 14, 1955. Debated for over a year, the resolution had 35 co-sponsors. However, fierce opposition existed among senior members, including Russell, Hayden, and Saltonstall, who were, re were reluctant to concede their committee's respective jurisdictions over the agency. An exchange between Mansfield and Saltonstall during the floor debate is indicative of the per perspective existing in the Senate at the time. From Mr. Mansfield, Mr. President, I know the Senator from Massachusetts speaks from his heart, but I wonder whether the question I shall ask now should be asked in public. If not, let the Senator from Massachusetts please refrain from answering it. How many times does the CIA request a meeting with the particular subcommittees of the Appropriations Committee and of the Armed Services Committee? And how many times does the Senator from Massachusetts request the CIA to brief him in regard to his existing affairs? Mr. Saltonstall. I believe the correct answer is that at least twice a year, 
that happens in the Armed Services Committee, and at least once a year it happens in the Appropriations Committee. I speak from my knowledge of the situation during the past year or so. I do not attempt to refer to previous periods. Certainly, the present administrator and the former administrator, General Bettle Smith, stated that they were ready at all times to answer any questions we might wish to ask them. The difficulty in connecting with, in connection with asking questions and obtaining information is that we might obtain information which I personally would rather not have unless it was essential for me as a member of Congress to have it. Mr. Mansfield says, Mr. President, I think the Senator's answer tells the whole story for he has informed us that a subcommittee of the Senate Armed Services Committee has met only twice a year with members of the CIA and that a subcommittee of the Senate Appropriations Committee has met only once a year with members of the CIA. Of course, it is very likely that the meetings in connection with the Appropriations Committee occurred only at a time when the CIA was making requests for appropriations. That information from the Senator from Massachusetts does not indicate to me that there is sufficiently close contact between the Congressional Committees and the CIA as such. Mr. Saltonstall, in reply, let me state, and I would, I should like to discuss this point more fully when I present my own views on this subject, that is, it is not a question of reluctance on the part of the CIA officials to speak to us. Instead, it is a question of our reluctance, if you will, to seek information and knowledge on subjects which I personally, as a member of Congress and as a citizen, would rather not have, unless I believed it to be my responsibility to have it because it might involve the lives of American citizens. Mr. Manfield says, I see the senator is to be commended, and that was the end of that one. Quote, Opposition to the resolution also existed in the executive branch. After its introduction, the NSC requested Dulles' analysis. The DCI responded with a long mem memorandum analyzing the problems such, as, such a committee would create. Although the memo did not express outright objection, the effect of enumerating the problems was to recommend against its establishment. Dulles expressed concerns about the possible breaches of security on the part of committee staff members. In particular, he stated that foreign intelligence services would object to information sharing and that U.S. liaison relationships would be jeopardized. Dulles ably convinced the senior members of the executive that an oversight committee was undesirable. Although the administration's objectives were undoubtedly known by the congressional leadership, the decisive factor in the defeat of the Mansfield Resolution was the opposition of the senior ranking members. In addition to the objections of Russell, a Russell Hayden and Saltonstall, Senator Albin Barkley, the former Vice President, and Senator Stuart Symington spoke strongly against the bill when it came to the floor. On April 11, 1956, the resolution was defeated, defeated by a vote of 59 to 27 with more than a dozen of their original co-sponsors voting against it. One change did result from the protracted debate on an oversight committee. Formal CIA subcommittees were created in the Armed Services and Appropriations Committees. Yet the same small group of individuals continued to be responsible for matters related to the agency. In the Armed Services Committee, Russell appointed Senator Saltonstall and Byrd both of whom had been meeting informally with Russell on agency activities to a CIA subcommittee. Subsequently, Senators Lyndon Johnson and Stiles Bridges were appointed to the subcommittee. In 1957, the Senate Appropriations Committee formalized a CIA subcommittee for the first time. The members of the subcommittee were again Russell, Bridges, and Byrd. Essentially, these three men held full responsibility for Senate oversight of the CIA. They frequently conducted the business of the two subcommittees at the same meeting. Despite attempts to regulate the subcommittee um, meetings, the most frequent form of interchange with the CIA remained personal communications between the subcommittee's chairman. Richard Russell and Alan Dulles in 1961, following the Bay of Pigs, Senator Eugene McCarthy attempted to revive the idea of a formally designated CIA Oversight Committee, but his effort failed. 
In the House, under Chairman Carl Vinson, the Armed Services Committee formally established a CIA subcommittee chaired by Vinson. The subcommittee reviewed the CIA's programs, budget, and legislative needs. Briefings on CIA operations were more regularized than in the Senate, and the House Armed Services staff maintained almost daily contact with the agency. The House Appropriations Committee did not establish a formal subcommittee. Instead, Cannon continually, continued to rely on a special group of five members. As part of the security precautions surrounding the functioning of the special group, its membership never became public knowledge. Section 2, Intelligence Production. Now everybody pause here. You all know what a production company is. I'll start reading again. In the decade of the 1950s, the CIA was a major contributor to technological advances in, t in intelligence collection. At the same time, DDI analysts were responsible for metho methodological innovations in strategic assessments. Despite these achievements, CIA's intelligence was not serving the purpose for which the organization had been created informing and influencing policy making. The size and structure of the Deputy Directorate for Intelligence remained constant during the Dulles administration, retaining the composition it acquired in 1950. ORR, OSI, OCI, and ONE were the centers of DDI's intelligence analysis. The Office of Current Intelligence continued to pump out its daily, weekly, and monthly publications, and in terms of volume, produced, produced dominated the DDI's output. OCI continued to compete with the other intelligence components of the government in providing up-to-the-minute summaries of worldwide events. In 19, the 1951 State Department CIA Agreement had given the ORR exclusive responsibility for economic research and analysis on the Soviet Union and its satellites, and it was in this area that the agency distinguished itself during the 1950s. ORR was divided into four principal components, the Office of the Assistant Director, the Economic Research Era, or ERA, area, ERA the Geographical Research Area, or GRA, and the coordination staff. The economic research area was the focus of the research and analysis effort. Each ERA division, analysis, industrials, materials, and service had two responsibilities. The production of all source economic intelligence on the Soviet Union and the production of material for NIEs. Day-to-day -day responsibility for coordination rested with the respective divisions, but most ERA publications were based on CIA data alone and did not represent coordinated interdepartmental intelligence. The quality of ERA's work benefited enormously from research and analysis done by outside consultants between 1953 and 1955. The Center for International Studies, or CENIS, C -E -N -I -S, at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT, made the principal contribution in this category. When Max Millikan left the di directorship of ORR in 1953, he arranged for an ongoing consultancy relationship between the agency and CENIS. The CNIS effort contributed substantially to ORR's innovations in the analysis of Soviet strategy comp strategic capabilities. Although at the insistence of the military, the agency was officially excluded from military analysis, ORR's immediate emphasis became Soviet strategy strategic research. There were two reasons for ORR's concentration in this area. First, the prevailing fear of the Soviet threat made knowledge of the Soviet strategic capabilities a priority concern for civilian policymakers as well as the military. Second, and more importantly, military analysis was the area where the agency had to establish itself in 
if it was to assume legitimacy as an intelligence producer in competition with the services. The military services constituted the agency's greatest threat in the execution of its mission, and only by generalizing strategic intelligence could CIA analysis begin to challenge the military's established position as intelligence producers. By introducing economic production capabilities into assessments of Soviet strategic capabilities, the agency challenged the basic premises of the military's judgments. For example, the Air Force mission required that it be informed about Soviet advances in nuclear weapons and air technology. The Air Force justified its budgetary claims in part on the basis of the projected size and capabilities of Soviet strategic forces. Air Force intelligence based its estimates on knowledge of Soviet technology and laboratory research, which by 1953 were well advanced. ORR based its estimates of Soviet deployments on Soviet economic production capabilities, which were severely limited as a result of the war. Consequently, ORR's methodology attributed lower strategic deployments, i.e. long-range bombers and missiles, to the Russians. ORR's contribution to the area of strategic assessments came quickly. In the mid-1950s, a major controversy developed over the Soviet Union's long-range bomber capability. The issue was complicated and testified because the military services were then suffering post-Korean War budget cuts and were vying with one another for marginal resources. Air Force estimates that the Russians were making a substantial investment in intercontinental bombers argued for disappropriate allocations to the United States Strategic Air Command and air defense systems also belonging to the Air Force. The Navy and Army both questioned the Air Force case. In the midst of this controversy, the Office of National Estimates, drawing heavily on the work done by ORR and by CNIS at MIT, produced its estimates of Soviet bomber production. The ONE assessments were more moderate than those of the Air Force. ONE analysts argued that because of production difficulties, the USSR could not operate as a large long-range bomber force as the Air Force was predicting. The agency's contribution to military estimates at this time marked the beginning of its gradual ascendancy over the military in strategic analysis. The real takeoff point for the agency occurred in the early 1960s with the data supplied by sophisticated overhead reconnaissance systems. Despite the agency's analytic advances, the extent to which the CIA estimates actually influenced policy was limited. The CIA had been created to provide high-quality national intelligence estimates to policymakers. However, the communication and exchange necessary for analysts to collaborate, anticipate, and respond to policymakers' needs never really developed. Although the NIEs were conceived and drafted with senior policymakers in mind, the estimates were not consistently read by high-level officials. Between 1955 and 1956, a senior staff member of the Office of National Estimates surveyed the NIE lead readership by contacting the executive assistants and special assistants of the president and cabinet officers, asking whether or not the NIEs were actually placed on their superiors' desks. The survey revealed that senior policymakers were not reading the NIEs, Instead, second- and third-level officials used the estimates for background information in briefing senior officials. Those are puppet masters, right? That's the Board of Governors standing behind everybody and puppeting them. Of all the products of the intelligence community, NIEs represented the broadest, most informed judgments available. The process of coordinating NIEs were laborious, involving protracted, painstaking negotiations over language and nuance. In these instances, where a department held views very different from those of the other agencies, a dissenting footnote in the estimate indicated the difference of opinions. The necessity to accommodate the views of numerous par participants 
meant that the conclusions were frequently hedged judgments rather than firm predictions. To obtain the broadest possible consensus, the specificity of the evaluations had to be compromised. This indefinite quality in the estimates limited the NIE's utility for policymakers. The failure of the NIEs to serve their fundamental purpose as basic information for senior officials was indicative of the overall failure of intelligence to intersect with policy. Even in an office as small as the Office of National Estimates, where the staff never exceeded 54 professionals, close interchange did not exist between staff specialists and senior consumer officials whose policy decisions depended on specific expert information. The problem was magnified throughout the DDI. The directorate's size con constituted a major obstacle to the attainment of consistent interchange between analysts and their clients. In 1955, there were 466 analysts in ORR, 217 in OCI, and 207 in OSI. The process of drafting, reviewing, and editing, and editing intelligence publications involved large numbers of individuals, each of whom felt responsible for and entitled to make a contribution to the final product. Yet without access to policymakers, analysts did not have an ongoing accurate mo notion of how and the form and substance of the intelligence product might best serve the needs of senior officials. The product itself, as defined and arbitrated among DDI analysts, rather than the satisfaction of sp specific policy needs, became the end. By the 1960s, the CIA had achieved significant advances in its strategic intelligence capability. The development of overhead reconnaissance, beginning with the U-2 aircraft and growing in scale and aircraft, was a technical achievement nothing short of spectacular. The U-2 represented dramatic advances in aircraft design and production as well as in-camera and film techniques. In July 1955, only 18 months after contracting the U-2 became operational and a fleet of 22 airplanes was deployed at a cost of $3 million below the original cost estimate. The U-2 market marked the beginning of the agency's emergence as the intelligence community leader in the area of technical collection capability. Soon after the first U-2 flight in 1955, Bissell moved quickly to organize the research and development of follow-up on systems. The agency never attempted to establish its own technological R&D capability. Instead, it continued to utilize the best private industrial manpower available. In large part, this arrangement accounts for the consistent vitality and quality of the agency's technical R&D capability, which remains unsurpassed to this day. The deployment of the U-2's follow-on systems coincided with the growing controversy over United States defense policy and the alleged Soviet advances in intercontinental missile deployment. The services, in particular, in particular the, the Air Force, produce estimates on Soviet missile capability which stated that the USSR was superseding the United States in long-range missile production. By 1959, the issue involving Congress involved Congress and became a subject of heated political debate in the 1960 presidential com campaign. Democrats, led by former Secretary of the Air Force, Senator Stuart Symington of Missouri, charged the Eisenhower administration with permitting the USSR to exceed the United States in bomber and missile strength. Data generated by the CIA's photographic reconnaissance systems produced evidence that these charges were ill-founded. The USSR had not approached the United States in missile production. It is unclear to what extent Eisenhower relied directly on ONE estimates in taking his position on the issue. The controversy was largely a political one, dividing along party lines. However, it is likely that Eisenhower's stance, if not actually determined by, was at least reinforced by ONE intelligence analysis, which was never made public. The development of overhead reconnaissance systems created a need for another group of intelligence specialists. 
photographic interpreters. The agency had established a photographic center in the DDI in 1953. As a result of the U-2 deployment, that group formed the nucleus of a quickly expanding specialty among intelligence analysts. In 1961, the National Photographic Interpretation Center, NPIC, was established under the DCI's direction. Staffed by CIA and military personnel, NPIC was a DDI component until 1973, when it was a component transferred to the Directorate for Science and Technology, or DDS&T. Now we'll pause there because this goes into the Inspector General's Act of 78, where uh, science and technology became one of the lead forces of control, of course, and the entity that provides the citizenry with these massive productions put on by the CIA. They're just a production company. That's all it is. These technological developments in the late 1950s constituted the beginning of an important expansion in the CIA's functions and capabilities. Technical collection was to have a significant effect on the agency's relationship to the departmental intelligence services and on the allocation of resources within the intelligence community. Part 3, the coordination problem. Dulles' neglect of the community management or coordination aspect of his role as DCI was apparent to all who knew and worked with him. During a period when the agency was responsible for numerous innovations, analytical and technical, Dulles might have seized the opportunity to strengthen the DCI's position relative to the military services. As the community became larger, and as technical systems required larger budgetary allocations, the institutional obstacles to coordination increased. Two, two episodes in Dulles' term illustrate his lack of initiative in coordination. One involved the Economic Research Area, or ORR, and the other, the Office of Scientific Intelligence. Both represented opportunities that, if taken, would have enhanced the DCI's capability to manage the community's intelligence activities. By 1956, a major portion of ERA's work was devoted to Soviet strategic analysis. The work was scattered throughout the four ERA divisions, making production unwieldy and inefficient. In that year, senior ERA personnel advanced a proposal to establish a military economics branch which would combine the fragmented military intelligence efforts then being conducted by NERA. Dulles rejected the recommendations on the grounds that the services might interpret such a move as a unilateral attempt by the agency to assume large responsibilities in their fields of primary concern. In effect, Dulles' reluctance to challenge the military services limited the agency's own work effort. More importantly, it allowed the agency's production of strategic intelligence to go without formal recognition in the community. A decision by Dulles to establish the agency's authority in the field of national military intelligence would have required a confrontation and a, a bureaucratic battle, neither of which Dulles was inclined to pursue. The second example involved the establishment of the Interdepartmental Guided Missiles Intelligence Committee, or GMIC, an Intelligence Advisory Committee subcommittee created in 1956. Since 1949, the Office of Scientific Intelligence had wrangled with the military services over the division of responsibility for producing scientific and technical intelligence. They were producing this. Please listen very carefully. DCID three quarters issued in 1952 stipulated that OSI's primary mission was research for basic scientific intelligence, leaving research for technical intelligence with the military. Despite the restrictions of DCID three slash four three quarters. The inseparable links between basic science and technology allowed OSI to branch into technical science. By 1955, OSI had a, five divisions in the technical sciences area, including a guided missiles intelligence division. In 
The growing community-wide emphasis on guided missiles intelligence raised the issues of interagency coordination. Discussions on the subject provo provoked a split between the State Department and the CIA on the one hand and the services on the other. State and the agency, specifically OSI, favored an interdepartmental committee with overall responsibility for coordinating and producing guided missile intelligence. The services and the joint staff favored exclusive Defense Department control. It took two years to resolve the issue. Between 1954 and 1956, Dulles hedged on the problem and was in, unwilling to press OSI's claims. Finally, in 1956, he took the matter to Secretary of Defense Charles Wilson, who supported the creation of a committee over the objectives of the Joint Staff and Navy and Army Intelligence. The services, however, retained the right to appoint the chairman. In both these instances, the organization of OCI and the formation of GMIC, Dulles had an opportunity in the first stages of new areas of intelligence production to establish a pattern of organization for the community and to assert the DCI's position. By not acting, Dulles allowed departmental procedures to become more entrenched and routinized, making later coordination attempts all the more difficult. At the time of the 1954 survey, the Clark Task Force of the Hoover Commission recognized the need for more efficient intelligence community management. The task force members recommended the appointment of a deputy director to assume internal management responsibilities for the agencies, leaving the DCI free for his coordination role. Dulles turned the recommendations around and appointed General Lucien Truscott his deputy for community affairs. Clearly, Truscott lacked even the DCI's limited authority in his coordinating task. Most of Truscott's efforts were directed at resolving jurisdictional conflicts between the agency and the military intelligence services, the most persistent and troublesome operation problem in intelligence community coordination involved the Army's espionage activities, particularly in Western Europe. The Army, Air Force, and to a lesser extent the Navy, had continued their in independent clandestine collection operations after the war. Among the services, the Army had been the most active in the field and grossly outnumbered the CIA in mound power. The services' justification for their operations had been that during wartime they would need clandestine collection support. That capability required long-term development. Services activities, in particular the armies, resulted in excessive duplication of the CIA effort and frequently competition for the same agents. In 1958, Truscott succeeded in working out, succeeded in working out an arrangement with the services, which attempted to rationalize clandestine act collection activities. A National Security Council intelligence directive assigned the CIA the primary responsibility for clandestine activities abroad. An accompanying directive gave the DCI's designated field representatives a modified veto over the services field activities by requiring that disagreements be referred to Washington for arbitration by the DCI and the Secretary of Defense. Although issuing new directives theoretically provided the DCI with authority over espionage activities, in practice the directives only created means of adjudicating disputes. Military commanders continued to rely on service intelligence personnel to satisfy their intel intelligence requirements. To some extent, the difficulties were eased after 1959, but this was not as a result of Truscott's efforts. The principal reason was that the development of technical collection systems made heavy drains on service intelligence budgets and reduced the funds available for human collection. After 1959, Air Force activities declined sharply as the service began developing overhead reconnaissance systems. Likewise, the availability of photographic data made the Army less able to justify large budgetary allocations for human collection. Within the executive branch, there were efforts to strengthen the direction of the intelligence community. In January 1956, President Eisenhower created the President's Board of Consultants on Foreign Intelligence Activities, or PBCFIA composed of retired senior governmental officials and members of the professions 
the PBCFIA was to provide the president with advice on intelligence matters. The board was a deliber deliberate body and had no authority over either the DCI or the community. Accordingly, it had little impact on the administration of the CIA or on the other intelligence services. The board did identify the imbalance in Dulles' role as DCI and in December 1956 and in December 1958 recommended the appointment of a chief of staff for the DCI to carry out the CIA's internal administration. In 1960, the board suggested the possibility of separating the DCI from the agency, having him serve as the president's intelligence advisor and as coordinator for community activities. Nothing resulted from these recommendations. In part, the failure to implement these proposals was a reflection of PBCFIA's importance. However, Dulles' personal standing had a major influence on policymakers' acceptance of his limited definition of the role. President Eisenhower, who himself repeatedly pressed Dulles to exert more initiative in the community, indicated his, his fundamental acceptance of Dulles' performance in a statement cited in a CIA history. Quoted here, I'm not going to be able to change Allen. I have two alternatives, either to get rid of him and appoint someone who will assert more authority or keep him with his limitations. I'd rather have Allen as my chief intelligence officer with his limitations than anyone else I know." End quote. On another level, the PBCFIA did try to create a stronger institutional structure for the community. In 1957, the board recommended merging the United States Communications Intelligence Board with I, the IAC. PBCFIA's proposal was directed at improving the community's overall direction. The USCIB was established in 1946 to advise and make recommendations on communication intelligence to the Secretary of Defense. The PBCFIA's recommendation for the IAC slash US CIB merger was intended to strengthen the DCI's authority and to improve intelligence coordination by making the DCI chairman of the newly established body. The services objected to the creation of the board since it meant that in the area of electronic intelligence they would be reduced to an advisory role vis-a-vis -vis the DCI and would lose the representational dom dominance they held in USCIB. Despite the service's objections, in 1958, the United States Intelligence Board, UC, USIB, was created to assume the duties of the IAC and USCIB, as with the IAC, USIB worked closely, worked mostly through interdepartmental subcommittees and special areas. Like the IAC, USIB was little more than a superstructure. It had no budgetary authority and did not provide the DCI with any direct control over the components of the intelligence community. The separate elements of the community continued to function under the impetus of their own internal drives and mission definitions. Essentially, the problem that existed at the time of the creation of the CIB remained. Show everything legal plus more. You never know what you're going to hear on the Bone Rocco Show at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Is there some kind of magic status that will keep you safe from quasi government intervention? Are there really multiple types of citizens? Doesn't matter if you're a citizen of the national state or the federal state. Is there such thing as a sovereign state? Should you claim constitutional rights? Here at the Bo and Rocco Show, we still maintain divesting off title, do no harm, indict those that do harm as a sovereign state under 28 U.S.C. Chapter 97. Stay tuned into freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio. From 1953 to 1961, a single presidential administration and consistent American policy objectives which had wide public and governmental support, contributed to a period of overall stability in the CIA's history. Alan Dulles' orientation and policymakers' operational reliance on the agency made clandestine activities the dominant CIA mission. The ethos of secrecy within the DDP allowed the directorate exemption from the usual accountability procedures 
resulting in a large degree of independence in the conduct of operations. The agency's intelligence production, though distinguished by the advances in technical collection and in ana analysis, had not achieved the consistent policy support role that had been the primary purpose for the CIA's creation. While Dulles may have served as a briefing officer during National Security Council meetings, and the day-to-day -day conduct of foreign policy policymakers did not look to the agency for information and analysis. The agency was equally unsuccessful in fulfilling its interdepartmental coordination function. The inherent institutional obstacles to management of the community's intelligence activities combined with Dulles' indifference to this area of responsibility allowed the perpetuation of a fragmented government-wide intelligence effort. Part 3. Change and Routinization, 1961 through 1970. Introduction. In the 1960s, as in the previous decade, the CIA's covert operational capability dominated agency activities. Policymakers' reliance on covert action fostered the CIA's utilization of its existing operational capabilities as well as an increase in paramilitary activities in support of counterinsurgency and military programs. In intelligence production, the agency expanded the areas of specialization, but senior government officials still did not consistently draw on the DDI's intelligence analysis or on the DCI for policy support. The most significant development for the agency during this period was the impact of technological capabilities on intelligence production. These advances resulted in internal changes and necessitated increased attention to coordinating the activities of the intelligence community. The large budgetary resources involved and the value of technical collection systems precipitated major bureaucratic battles and pointed up the increasing rather than diminishing problems surrounding interagency participation in the intelligence process. Despite the agency's internal adjustments and a sustained effort in the early 1960s to affect better management in the community, the CIA's fundamental structure, personnel, and incentives remained rooted in the early 1950s. Beginning in the fall of 1961, the CIA vacated its scattered array of buildings in downtown Washington and moved to its present structure in Langley, Virginia. Alan Dulles had lobbied long and hard to acquire a single building for the agency. Reasons of efficiency and the need for improved security dictated the move. Several locations were considered, including a building in the city. However, no single downtown structure could accommodate all the agency's employees stationed in Washington and also provided the requisite security for the clandestine component. The availability of land in Langley, eight miles from the city, made a new building there seem the ideal solution. The effects of the move are difficult to gauge. Some have argued that the building has encouraged interchange between the DDI and the DDP, making the agency's agency a more integrated organization. That benefit seems marginal given the procedural and institutional barriers between the two directors. A more significant effect may be on the negative side, specifically the physical isolation of the agency from the policymakers it was created to serve. In 1961, Cold War attitudes continued to shape the foreign policy assumption of the United States officials. One need only recall the militant tone of John F. Kennedy's January 1961 inaugural address to appreciate the accepted definition of the United States role. The Soviet pronouncement ending the moratorium on nuclear testing in July 1961 and the erection of the Berlin Wall a month later reinforced existing attitudes. In the early years of the decade, American confidence and conviction were manifested in an expansive foreign policy that included the aborted Bay of Pigs invasion, a dramatic confrontation with the Soviet Union over the installments of Soviet missiles in Cuba, increased economic assistance to underdeveloped countries in Latin America and Africa, and rapidly escalating military activities in Southeast Asia. Although the American presence in Vietnam beginning in 1963 symbolized U.S. adherence to the structures of the Cold War, perceptions of the, US, of the Soviet Union had begun to change. 
the image of an international communist monolith began breaking down as differences between the USSR and the People's Republic of China emerged. Moreover, the strategic arms competition assumed increased importance in Soviet, in Soviet American relations. By the mid-1960s, the Soviet Union possessed a credible but minimal nuclear deterrent against the United States. By the end of the decade, the two nations were approaching strategic parity. Soviet advances provided the impetus for efforts at arms control and for attempts at greater cooperation in cultural and economic areas. The CIA was drawn into each of these major developments in United States policy. Now, what you're witnessing here is the creation of everything, intelligence production. So you need to really go back and look into your history, folks, because this is just so sad. Um, the CIA is, is actually a, just a production company. Uh, we need to look at it as such and then really, really look at the media and what it's doing to the populace globally by teaching such concepts. They're, they're implicating and teaching these concepts so that uh, the populace or citizenry will agree to go to war with other countries. This is exactly what is happening in Syria right now. Subsection 1, the Directors of Central Intelligence from 1961 through 1970. In the 1950s, Alan Dulles had given his personal stamp to the agency and in large measure independently defined his role as DCI. In the next decade, the successive presidents, John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, and Richard M. Nixon had a greater influence on the role of DCI, his stature, and his relative position among policymakers. John A. McCohen, November 1961 through April 1965. John McCohn came to the Central Intelligence Agency as an outsider. His background had been in private industry where he had distinguished himself as a corporate manager. Trained as an engineer, McCohn entered the construction business and rose to become Executive Vice President of Consolidated Steel Corporation. Later in his career, he founded his own engineering firm and during World War II became involved in shipbuilding and aircraft production. Following the war, he served on several government committees and held the position of Undersecretary of the Air Force. In 1958, McCone was named to the Atomic Energy Commission, and later that year, he took over as its chairman. The Bay of Pigs failure precipitated President Kennedy's decision to replace Alan Dulles and to appoint a DCI who had a more detached view of the agency's operational capability. McCone brought a quick, sharp intellect to his job as DCI and he devoted much of his attention to sorting out management problems at the community level. His political independence as a staunch Republican in a Democratic administration as well as his personal confidence made him a strong and assertive figure among policymakers. Unquestionably, the missile crisis in October 1962 solidified McCone's place in the Kennedy administration as an active participant in the policy process. The human and technical resources that the agency brought to bear, U-2 flights over Cuba, overhead reconnaissance over the USSR, supplemented by agents in both places, clearly identified the agency's contribution in a period of crisis and enhanced McCone's position as DCI. McCone resigned in 1965 because Lyndon Johnson had not accorded him the stature and access he had enjoyed under Kennedy. Vice Admiral William Rayborn, April 1965 through June 1966. At the time of his appointment as DCI, Vice Admiral William Rayborn had retired from the Navy and was employed in the aerospace industry. A graduate of Annapolis, Rayborn had had a successful naval career as an administrator and combat officer. His most significant accomplishment was his participation in the development of the Polaris missile system. Immediately prior to his retirement from the Navy in 1963, Rayborn served as Deputy Chief of Naval Operations. He was Director of Central Intelligence for only a year and his impact on the agency was minimal.
Richard M. Helms, June 1963, 6 through February 1973. Richard Helms became DCI following nearly 25 years in the clandestine service. Just as Alan Dulles had identified himself with the intelligence professions, Helms identified himself with the agency as an institution. Having served in a succession of senior positions since the early 1950s, Helms was a first generation product of the CIA and he commanded the personal and professional respect of his counter contemporaries. Helms' international orientation began early. Most of his secondary education consisted of private schooling in Germany and Switzerland. After graduating from Williams College in 1935, he worked as a journalist. In 1942, he joined the service and was assigned to OSS. Helms remained an intelligence officer through the transitions to SSU and the Central Intelligence Group. As a member of the CIA's Office of Special Operations, he rose to become Deputy Assistant Director for Special Operations. An excellent administrator, he served as Assistant Deputy Director for Plans ADDP under both Wisner and Bissell. In 1963, Helms was named DDP and was appointed Deputy Director of Central Intelligence DDCI under Rayborn. As Director of Central Intelligence, Helms' interest remained on the operations side and he did not display a strong interest in the management problems related to the intelligence community. One colleague stated that during his term as Director, Helms ran the DDP out of his hip pocket. Helms labored under the difficulty of two presidents who were not receptive to the DCI's function as Senior Intelligence Officer. Lyndon Johnson was mired in Vietnam and bent on military victory, Richard Nixon had an inherent distrust of the agency and preferred to work within his White House staff. Neither president gave the DCI the opportunity to fulfill his role as chief intelligence advisor. Subsection 2, the clandestine service. A. Clandestine activities 1961 through 1970. The clandestine service dominated the agency's activities during this period. In budget, manpower, and degree of DCI attention, accorded the DDP, clandestine operations remain the CIA's most consuming mission. The DDP continued to function as a highly compartmented structure with small groups of individuals responsible for and privy to selected activities. That ethos unquestionably fostered and supported the development of such excessive operations as assassination plots against foreign leaders. Nonetheless, the policies and operational preferences of the executive branch dictated the priorities in the agency's activities. Evidence of communist guerrilla activities in Southeast Asia and Africa convinced President Kennedy and his closest advisors, including Robert Kennedy, and General Maxwell Taylor of the need for the United States to develop an unconventional warfare capability. Counterinsurgency, as the U.S. effort was designated, aimed at preventing communist-supported military victories without precipitating a major Soviet-American military confrontation. Simultaneously, the CIA was called on to develop and employ its paramilitary capabilities around the world. In the decade of the 1960s, Paramilitary operations became the dominant CIA clandestine activity, surpassing covert psychological and political action and budgetary allocations by 1967. Political action, propaganda, and operations involving international organizations continued. By the early 1960s, the DDP had developed the infrastructure, assets in place, which allowed the development of continuing activities. The combination of the paramilitary surge and self-sustaining operations made the period of 1964 to 1967 the most active for the execution of covert activities. In the 1950s, the administrative arrangements in the DDP were highly centralized. The DDP or his assistant, the ADDP, personally approved every project initiated either at headquarters or in the field. By 1960, the delegation of approval authority became a bureaucratic necessity. Because the number of projects had proliferated, no one or two individuals could either efficiently act on 
or competently make judgments on the multitude of proposed activities. In 1960, a graduated approval process began to develop in the DDP whereby station chiefs and division chiefs were authorized to approve projects depending on cost and potential risk factors. The more sensitive projects were referred to the ADDP, the DDP, or the DCI. The extent to which the procedural changes affected the number and nature of projects approved is unclear. Under the direction of the Kennedy administration, paramilitary programs were initiated in Cuba, Laos, and Vietnam. The failure of the Bay of Pigs did not diminish senior officials' conviction that the U.S. had to take offensive action against the Cuban government. It is difficult to appreciate the near obsession that characterized attitudes towards Fidel Castro in the first two years of the Kennedy administration. The presence of an avowed communist leader 90 miles from the Florida coastline was regarded as an intrusion on U.S. primacy in the Western Hemisphere and as a direct threat to American security. Between October 1961 and October 1962, the agency conducted Operation Mongoose. The program consisted of collection, paramilitary, sabotage, and political propaganda activities aimed at discrediting and ultimately toppling the Castro government. Mongoose was administrated, administered through a special headquarters task force, Task Force W, that was comprised of some of the most able DDP idea men and operators. Describing the intensity of the agency's effort and the breadth of activities that were generated, one former Task Force W member stated, quote, It was very simple. We were at war with Cuba, end quote. The Cuban effort coincided with a major increase in the agency's overall Latin American program. The perception of the growing Soviet presence in the Western Hemisphere, both politically and through guerrilla activity in Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia, resulted in a 40% increase in the size of the Western Hemisphere Division between 1960 and 1965. In the early 1960s, the decolonization of Africa sparked an increase in the scale of CIA clandestine activities on that continent. CIA actions parallel growing interests on the part of the State Department and the Kennedy administration in the third world countries, which were regarded as a line of defense against the Soviet Union. The government-wide assumption was that Soviet Union would attempt to encroach on the newly independent African states. Prior to 1960, Africa had been included in the European or Middle Eastern Division. In that year, it became a separate division. Stations sprang up all over the continent. Between 1959 and 1963, the number of CIA stations in Africa increased by 50.5%. Apart from limiting co communist advances through propaganda and political action, the agency's African activities were directed at gaining information on communist China, the Soviet Union, and North Korea. The agency's large-scale involvement in Southeast Asia began in 1962 with programs in Laos and Vietnam. In Laos, the agency implemented air supply and paramilitary training programs, which gradually developed into full-scale management of a ground war. Between 1962 and 1965, the agency worked with South Vietnamese government to organize police forces and paramilitary units. After 1965, the CIA engaged in a full-scale paramilitary assistance program to South Vietnam. The CIA program paralleled the escalating U.S. military commitment to South Vietnam. The agency's extensive operational involvement in Southeast Asia had a tangible impact on the leadership within the DDP. By 1970, large numbers of individuals began retiring from the agency. Essentially, these were the first-generation CIA professionals who had begun their careers in the late 1940s. Many were OSS veterans who had been promoted to senior positions early and remained. As these men began leaving the agencies, may, many of their positions were filled by individuals who had distinguished themselves as in Southeast Asia-related activities. In the clandestine service, the present deputy director for operations, his predecessor, the chief of the counterintelligence staff, 
and the deputy chief of the Soviet East European Division all spent considerable time in the Far East at the height of the agency's effort there. By the end of the decade, the level of covert operations began to decline. Measured in terms of project numbers, budgetary expenditures, and personnel, the DDP's covert operations diminished between 1967 and 1971. The process of reduction extended over several years and derived principally from factors outside the agency. The most conspicuous intrusion into CIA operations was the 1967 Ramparts magazine article which exposed CIA funding of international student groups, foundations, and private voluntary organizations that had begun in the 1950s. The revelation resulted in President Johnson's appointment of a three-person committee to examine the CIA's covert funding of American educational and private voluntary organizations operating abroad. Chaired by the Under Secretary of State, Nicholas Kazenbach, the committee included DCI Richard Helms and Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare John Gardner. After conducting its review, the Kazenbach Committee recommended that no federal agency provide covert financial assistance to American educational and voluntary institutions. The Kazenbach report prompted an internal CIA examination of its domestic-based organizational activities. Although the agency complied with the strict terms of the Kazenbach guidelines, funding and contract work arrangements were realigned so that overseas activities could continue with little reduction. Okay, so they just put on a show, show's over, life goes on, don't look at the man behind the curtain. Overall, funding to educational private voluntary organizations constituted a small proportion of covert activities and the Kosenbach report did not affect major operations in the areas of overseas political action, labor, and propaganda. Government-wide personnel cutbacks and a wider impact on covert operations. In 1967 and 1969, concern over the U.S. balance of payment deficits prompted executive orders reducing the number of federal employees stationed overseas. Budgetary limitations imposed by the Office of Management and Budget and the State Department restrictions on the number of cover positions made available to CIA personnel also contributed to significant reduction in DDP personnel. By the end of the decade, internal concern developed over the problem of exposure for large-scale large operations. It was this factor that determined Helm's 1970 decision to transfer the budgetary allocations for operations in Laos from the CIA to the Defense Department. Gradually, senior agency personnel began to recognize the cumulative effects of long-term subsidies to and associations with political parties, media, and agents overseas. A large presence invited attention and was vulnerable to exposure. During this period of escalation and declining covert operations, clandestine collection was also undergoing some changes. As indicated in the pre preceding chapter, in the 1950s much of the DDP's clandestine information had, for a variety of reasons, come from Lee's own relationships with host governments. By the early 1960s, the clandestine service had developed its own capabilities and was less dependent on liaison for executing its clandestine collection functions. DDP case officers had in approximately 10 years to engage in the long-range process of spotting, assessing, cultivating, and recruiting agents. As Deputy, as Deputy Director for Plans from 1962 to 1965, Richard Helms attempted to upgrade the DDP's clandestine collection of missions. Helms had been an OSO officer and in contrast to both Wisner and Bissell, his professional identity had been forged on the collection side of the clandestine service. In the early 1960s, Helms embarked on a concerted effort to improve DDP training to produce officers who could recruit agents as well as maintain liaison relationships. Technological developments had a major impact on clandestine collection targets, the specific objects of an agent's collection effort. From at least the early 1950s, information related to Soviet strategic capabilities was a continuous priority for clandestine human source collection. However, the difficulties of access to the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe 
the so-called denied areas, left even the most basic information out of the reach of human collection. Reconnaissance filled the gap, providing hard data on Soviet strategic deployments, locations of missile sites, production centers, and transport facilities. With the acquisition of these broad categories of information, human collection was redirected to more specific targets, including research and development. Subsection B, Executive Authorization. During the 1962 through 1970 period, procedures for executive authorization of covert action projects became more regularized and criteria for approval became more strictly defined. In large part, these procedural changes reflected a belated rec recognition that covert operations were no longer exceptional activities undertaking, undertaken in extraordinary circumstances. Instead, covert operations had become an ongoing element in the conduct of U.S. foreign policy and required formalized channels of review and approval. Although the approving bodies went through a number of name changes and adjustments in membership, fundamental assumptions governing review remained the same. Each group functioned in a way that blurred accountability for decisions, no participant was required to sign off on individual decisions, and the frequency of meetings was irregular. The absence of strict accountability was intentional. By shielding the president and senior officials from direct association with covert operations, it was possible for the chief of state to publicly deny responsibility for an exposed operation. Such was the theory. In fact, as the Soviet attack on the U-2 in May 1960 illustrated, the president was historically assumed ultimate re ultimate responsibility for U.S. actions. During the Kennedy administration, the special group served as a review body for covert action. The Taylor Report in June 1961 redefined the membership of the group in an effort to ensure better review and coordination for the anticipated expansion in mil paramilitary activities. It was not until 1963 that formal criteria developed for submitting covert action projects to the group. Until then, the judgment of the DCI had determined whether an agency orig originated project was submitted to the group and its predecessor bodies for authorization. In 1963, project cost and risk became the general criteria for determining whether a project had to be submitted to the special group. Although the specific criteria were not established in writing, the agency used $25,000 as the threshold amount and all projects at that level and above were submitted for approval. Agency officials judged the relative risk of a pro proposed project, its potential for exposure, possibility for success, and political sensitivity. The Kennedy administration's initiation of large-scale paramilitary activities resulted in the creation of two additional working groups, the Special Group on Counterinsurgency, or CI, and the Special Group Augmented. The special group, CI, had only three members, General Maxwell Taylor, the President's military advisor, McGeorge Bundy, the Assistant for National Security Affairs, and Attorney General Robert Kennedy. Established in January 1963, the special group, CI, was to provide coordination for counterinsurgency programs. The special group, Augmented, was responsible for supervising only one operation, Mongoose. The members of this body included McGeorge Bundy, Deputy Secretary of Descent Roswell Gilpatrick, Under Secretary of State U. Alexis Johnson, Chairman of the JCS Lyman Lemnitzer, McCone, Taylor, and Robert Kennedy. The special group augmented engaged in close supervision of and liaison with CIA officials regarding the execution of the Mongoose program. Following the disbandment of the operation in October 1962, the special group augmented was dissolved. The changes that occurred under Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon demonstrated that the review process remained subject to a working habits and preferences of individual presidents. During the Johnson administration, the special group was renamed the 303 Committee. However, the real forum for National Security Council level decisions became the quote, Tuesday lunches, end quote, a luncheon meeting at the White House that included President Johnson, Helms, McNamara, Bundy, 
later his successor, Walt Rostow, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and press secretary to the president. These discussions were dominated by the subject of military operations in Vietnam and the informality of the meetings fostered consensual fuzziness rather than hard choices. In, uh, in February 1970, the Basic Directive Governing Covert Action Authorization or National Security Council 5412-2 was replaced by National Security Decision Memorandum NSDM 40. That directive spelled out the duties of the newly designated 40 Committee, which replaced the special group as the executive decision-making body on covert operations. NSDM 40 restated the DCI's responsibility for coordinating and controlling covert operations. Its only real modification from 5412-2 directive was a provision that the 40 Committee annually review covert action projects previously approved. A major shortcoming in the review process was the limited number of projects subject to external authorization. The vast majority of covert action projects were initiated and approved within the agency. Moreover, whole categories of projects were exempt from outside authorization. Covert political action projects those involving political parties, the press, media, and labor unions are often made possible and supported by the existence of clandestine collection projects. The assets maintained through these projects provide access and information and serve as conduits for resources. Despite their importance to covert action projects and their frequently indistinguishable function, such projects were not defined as covert action and therefore were exempt from external authorization. In the field, covert action coordinates between the State Department and the CIA was a continuing problem. Since the relationship between ambassadors and chiefs of station was not strictly defined, consultation between state and CIA was uneven. Ambassadors were generally informed of broad covert action programs undertaken in the host country, but frequently did not know the details. Identities of agents, methods of action, scope of the program, some ambassadors preferred not to know the extent of CIA activity, regarding it as a diplomatic liability to be too closely identified with the CIA. Still, it was not unusual for ambassadors themselves to recommend or request the initiation of covert intervention to bring about political conditions more favorable to the U.S. policy. In each case, the kind of information an ambassador received was dependent on his preference for being informed, his disposition to assert his prerogatives, and his relationship with the CIA station chief. Efforts to improve coordination and to give the ambassador a more formalized role were ineffective. In 1961, President Kennedy addressed a letter to all ambassadors indicating their responsibilities to oversee and coordinate all embassy activities. A similar letter was addressed to ambassadors by President Nixon in 1969. These presidential initiatives did not fundamentally alter relationships in the field. Having no direct authority over the station chief, an ambassador could only make requests in his capacity as head of the country team, the ranking government agency representatives posted to the embassy. He could not make demands or exercise formal control based on a position of recognized seniority. In terms of overall foreign policy coordination, the situation was less than satisfactory. And this ends my two-hour span. Next, we'll work on C, subsection C, Congressional Review, and I have been reading out Book 4, Supplementary Detailed Staff Reports on Foreign and Military Intelligence. And again, until next time, be well. Rocco Show, everything legal plus more. You never know what you're going to hear on the Bill and Rocco Show at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Okay, which is also Congress because under 28 U.S.C. 453, as I consistently harp on, you are the special deposit that judge is making to offset congressional debt. God, I get so high, I get tired of hearing these alternative news stations talking about the...
The bankers, the bankers, the bankers. And they have no idea who the bankers are. Okay, it's not a J.P. Morgan and, and you know, Chase and the rest of them. Okay, those are nice faces. The bankers are those judges offset in congressional debt with you as a special deposit. You're making the money that they're spending to go kill people and depopulate the world. What part of that don't you understand? I'll say it a little slower. You are... The money being created that is being used to depopulate the world and spread war to kill people to keep the world safe for their banking schematic. Features of the common herd. Now, all this division, racism, religion, etc., 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 Feminism and all the rest of it, all created and perpetuated by Congress. 